Take your Bibles, go to Genesis. I had somebody tell me the other day we was in Genesis for three years. I was like, I get out of here, man. I can't believe it's been that long. But, uh, but I've been reading my Bible for 42, so what's the big deal about that? So we're going to start with Genesis 1-1 today. <laughs> I left my glasses at home, so I got two options. My wife, what do y'all think? I don't know about that. Man, I, was, uh, I can't do that because I'd be the biggest hypocrite you've ever seen. I went to uh, a church one time. The guy got up and had a pair of these on. I made fun of him. They were white. I, could, I just couldn't do it, man. So I put on my black ones. Genesis. Genesis, 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 Genesis. Man, it's, it's been a good week. Uh, got a lot done. Still got a lot to do. Y'all pray. I've got a house I'm trying to get rid of. Y'all pray that if you could, just memory and prayer every now and then we get that thing done and sold so I can get out from under it and be done with it. Genesis 1. So, uh, we're, we're looking at Lot here. And Lot, Lot has got some serious issues going on. And uh, no matter how you look at it, it uh, the Lord said back in uh, 2,000 years ago, he says, as it was in the days of Lot. So he was projecting that that time frame was going to be out into our time frame today. Uh, we deal with the LGBTQRABCDFGHJKLMLP uh, community all the time. And that's exactly where he was at. So we're right in that mess right now. I had a, I had a real good call yesterday. I called uh, a friend of mine in Norfolk. I was talking to him, and uh, he, go, he was mad at me. And he goes, I was watching you online. I haven't seen the guy for 37 years. He goes, I was watching you online, and you mentioned the Ponce, but you never mentioned the Scott. I said, okay, brother, I'll repent. I'll, tell, I'll do a whole sermon today on the Scott. And uh, <laughs> he, was, he was just laughing back and forth. And uh, he was just telling me some stuff, and he's scared. And uh, I said, well, brother, what's wrong? And I was trying to figure out whether, he was, whether it was spiritual. He goes, it's not, it's not spiritual. He goes, I'm in a church. I'm doing okay there. He goes, but I've been working for 20 years, and they're getting ready to fire me because I don't have my COVID shot. And he goes, I'm scared. I said, brother, I wouldn't be scared. I said, you need to trust the Lord. Uh, this thing is rapidly going. I don't have a problem with COVID shot. I, I choose not to take it, I, if you choose to take it. If you take it and it's supposed to keep you from getting COVID, why are you worried if I don't have it? Because you can't get it from me anyways because you're protected, right? So why would it, why would it matter to you other than it? It doesn't protect you like Colin Powell. If you could ask Colin Powell right now, you'd find out that it didn't protect him very well. I mean, I, I don't understand why they even lead out with that story. Uh, Colin Powell died with COVID uh, uh, something, he, COVID symptoms or COVID whatever they were uh, because of COVID. And, and then he sits here and then they say, but it had nothing to do with the COVID vaccine. Wait a second. You mean the COVID vaccine didn't help him? I mean, why in the world should I even take it? So... You get into all this stuff, and Lot's in this environment. He's right there, and here's where we're at. We're living in this environment. You can still live in this environment and survive. You can still live here and do the right thing. You can still live here and have a godly life and a Christian life. But I'm telling you, it's going to take, it's going to take a stance on our part. Lot, Lot never had that stance. But you know what a blessing is about Lot? No matter when you're going to find out here in the next couple uh, verses. Hopefully I can get through this chapter today. i got 40 minutes. Uh, but he, he, that shows you even a backslidden Christian, God will take care of a backslidden Christian with the help of somebody else. Uh, the prayers of a righteous man avail much. Lot better be glad that he had Abraham. Lot never, never let go of the city. Uh, when the Lord told Abraham to get the out or the Chaldees way back when, he told Abraham that. He didn't tell that to Lot. He didn't tell that to his dad, Haran, or anybody else. He told it to Abraham. Abraham drug a bunch of other people with him. Uh, for some reason, we just don't like being alone. I don't know what that is. Uh, but in verse 8, it says, Behold now, he says, I have two daughters. So they, these, all these guys are at his front door. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for just letting us come to church. Lord, thank you for a, a place we can come on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights. And, and Lord, I don't have to worry about uh, anything. It's paid for, Lord. It's all yours. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, Lord, we don't have to worry about the city or the counties or anything else. We've met all the rules and regulations. And and Lord, uh, it's just, it's a blessing. But any, at any given time, Lord, anything could come up and, and Lord, we could be forced or try to be forced into things. And Lord, when those days come, Lord, I pray that you help us to be able to stand like we ought to stand. Uh, help us to look at our Bible, Lord, and see the stories and the different things that occurred here. And Lord, help us to take uh, lessons from the life of Lot, apply them to our life, Lord, that we can see uh, what we should and shouldn't, shouldn't do. 
And Father, again, we'll praise you on you. Bless the other Sunday school classes. And Lord, just thank you for letting us be in church this morning. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and go up to your boss and tell him he's of the devil and, and all this other stuff. I'm not saying that. Uh, but you got it. I was in the military, and, and once you sign a piece of paper, you're locked in. I was locked in for six years. Uh, that was my job. I finished my job, and I did it well. I, when I left the, the Ponce, the captain told me when I left, he said, Mike, we put you through hell for the last four months. He goes, you were a better ET in those four months than, than you were the whole time you were on our ship. He said, you were great when you were here. I've never seen anybody like you. I talked to um, uh, that brother of mine on the, on the Scott. He works in satellites right now. He flies all over the place. He, he's going to fly down to a submarine base to work on some submarines. And he goes, Mike, you were the best ET I've ever met. This is, this is 37 years later. When you walk on a ship or you walk in this life and you tell people you're a Christian, your testimony better be as squeaky clean as you can make it. And you better be the best employee that you could possibly ever be. Because this world is looking at you. Here's a guy I haven't seen for 37 years. I mean, it was encouraging to me when he said that. Because, you know, sometimes you just like, uh, you just want to find a corner somewhere and hide in. And he still, he still remembers me. He called me. I didn't call him. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, the, the testimony you have should linger and linger, just go on and on and on. Because you never know what opportunity. Here's a guy that is in trouble. By the time we got off, he was laughing. I told him, I said, hey, he lives right down the street from Fritz Biederstadt. And him and Fritz, he goes, I haven't talked to Fritz in years. Now, what, what is right down the street? I'm not sure if it's five miles, ten miles, two feet, three houses. Uh, and I told him, I said, hey, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you what you do, brother. I said, you go down to Fritz. And he goes, so you're going to make me go talk to Fritz, aren't you? I said, you and Fritz got a problem? He goes, no. He goes, my wife talks to his wife. I said, yeah, his wife talks a lot, man. Women just talk. <laughs> Uh, I called I called Fritz one time. I got his phone number called, and Cheryl opened the got picked up the phone, and I'm like, uh, "Hello," and she goes, "Mike Elliott." I'm like, "How do you how do you know me?" She goes, "I know that voice anywhere." I'm like, "Okay, I haven't talked to you in twenty something years," and she goes, "I said, well, is Fritz at home?" She goes, "Yes, he is." I said, "Can I talk to him?" She says, "No, you can't." I'm like, "Why not?" She goes, "Well, I want to talk to you a while first. So, so we haven't seen each other in a while. So we talked to each other, and, and then she let me have Fritz. And, uh, I, and I told John, I said, John, he goes, yeah, he goes, uh, my wife, Michelle, talks to him all the time. And uh, she goes, or to her, I said, but you haven't talked to Fritz? He goes, no. He said, you're going to make me talk to Fritz, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not going to make you do nothing. I just think you ought to go down there and talk to him, wherever he is. You made it sound like he's like three doors down. Uh, and he goes, I said, if you go down and talk to him, I'll tell you what I'll do. And you arrange a time, I'll fly out there and we'll go out and have lunch. I said, I'll fly into Norfolk. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll foot the bill for the ticket. I'll make him feel bad when I get there so they'll, they'll pay for it. But uh, when I said, I will go out and have lunch, talk for a few minutes, and then we can all go our separate ways. I said, but we'll set up a time. Brother, I'm telling you what, it's 37 years ago, I got to have an influence on a young man's life. I, I still remember him, a little mustache, the whole thing. And he left the ship. He did his four and no more and got out. And he's doing good. He said, Mike, I'm doing really, really well in the world. But he goes, they're getting ready to lay me off because, or let me go because I won't get that shot. And I'm thinking, this whole world's getting that way. It's getting to a place where, where the, the financial stuff is going to be dangling in front of your eyeballs. And I'm not saying you're out of God's will if you don't take the shot. I'm not saying that. I'm telling you the devil is going to get to the place where he's going to start dangling stuff in front of your face and he goes, this is, this is my world. I own it right now. Ask Jesus Christ. He gave it to me. And, and if you're going to exceed in my world, if you're going to grow in my world, if you're going to do this in my world, you got to let the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. That's what I told him yesterday. I said, look, I ain't telling you what to do either way. I said, brother, you got to get to the place where you let the Holy Spirit tell you. If you don't, what you'll do is you'll get like Lot and not be able to make a decision. Lot, Lot was sitting there, and these two angels popped up. Two angels popped up to his door. He still didn't know who they were at the beginning, but he got it shortly there afterwards. And here's just two men at his door, and he goes, Behold now, verse 8, I have two daughters, which have not known men, as far as he knows, they're virgins. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. What kind of man would do that? Uh, someone who got backslidden. We're talking a lot here. We're talking over in Peter, he's called righteous. Here's a righteous man doing this. And do to, to them as is good in your eyes. They're a bunch of faggot, sinking perverts. And he goes, only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under my roof. Now, 
I want to stop here for a second. Brother, we're doing the exact same thing to our kids today that they did right here. Except we're turning them over to the world for school, for sports, for everything else, and expect them to turn out some, some way different than what these kids are going to turn out right here. The world is taking, show me a kid that come out right. I went, I sent all my kids to Christian school. Almost every one of them over there. I was talking to a brother yesterday. I, was, I didn't even know who he was, man. I mean, I got to lose some weight. Because I, I'm in Kroger's getting my woohoo deals. And I walked by this guy and I said, oh, excuse me. He goes, Brother Elliot, Brother Elliot. I'm like, oh, no. Am I, am I supposed to know this guy? And, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's definitely not weight challenged. He has a few extra pounds that he could possibly get with him. He's, he's gained a couple pounds. Well, maybe more than a couple. <coughs> but we started talking. And uh, just the different things he was going through. And, and I sit there and, and he, said, he said, he's talking about his brother. And he goes, he pulled his kids out of school, Christian school. I'm like, really? I said, his brother-in-law teaches at Christian school. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, that's strange. And, and he goes, yeah. He goes, because the, the kids are getting tainted by the world. And that's the exact same thing. Lot, Lot did something. He threw his kids right into But they already lived there anyways. He had them in the city. They were already in it anyways. You can be, I believe you can be in a city and not be part of it. There's no way I can guarantee what Andrew, Elizabeth, Sarah, Jesse, and, and uh, Esther is going to do in life. There's no way I can guarantee any part of that. I can only do the best I can do to get through it and show them a way to get through it. And we can get through it. You can get through it. Uh, you can still be that testimony. You don't have to do it. I don't play well with people. I've never played well with people. I have a few friends that I can get around and they can tolerate me, which is a blessing. I thank God for Brother Mike and I thank God for Brother uh, uh, George. Uh, Rich, Rich doesn't know me real well yet because uh, he's, he's hanging around a little bit. But, <laughs> but the more he hangs around, he may not. But Brother Mike puts up with a lot of stuff for me. And you don't find many people that can do that. Uh, because when, when you get around people and then they start putting their finger on you, uh, I was talking about a preacher the other day that I, I'd hear every now and then on the radio. It was still on the radio, and I was telling Brother uh, Rich about it, and he goes, oh, he got in big trouble. So I went out and looked, and sure enough, man, I mean, big trouble. And I'm sitting there going, you, you can't, you, those guys, and I was thinking God, I said, boy, thank you for a little church that I don't have a lot of money either way, and I, it's just a lot of things you can't get in trouble with. Uh, you start putting money in your pocket and, and notoriety and uh, being famous, it causes you all kinds of trouble. But it's the world you live in. Abraham didn't have that problem up on the side of the mountain. He didn't have the, the billboards and the night lights and all that other stuff getting to him. He didn't have that stuff. Uh, Lot is willing to sacrifice his own flesh and blood, and I mentioned this last time probably, to oppose, to appease the reprobates. Why? Why would I sacrifice my sons and daughters or my grandkids to that filthy, stinking world? I won't do it. I just refuse it. I told all my kids they wanted to play sports. You can go play it, man. I said, I ain't going to stop you from doing it. I just ain't going to take you. I knew they couldn't get there because they couldn't walk that far. But uh, Beth, then Beth goes, I'll do it. I'll do it. We, we don't stop and realize. I told my mom the other day. She got mad at me. I told her, I said, look, I said, it, the Catholic Church is an idol to you. Oh, it is not. It is. I said, yeah, it is. You put it between you and Jesus. I said, for, for 40 years I've talked to you, and every time I've talked to you, you, you say, well, are, we are taught. I don't care what you're taught. Uh, what's the Bible say? Amen. There's where our problem is in life is we look at where we, what we've heard or what we think, and we don't look at what the Bible says. And the Bible's clear about some stuff, and he says, as it was in the days of Lot. Uh, there is people out there doing exactly what Lot is doing right now. The rest of us, we just do it to some other degree. The outcome is still the same. Uh, we... Mankind continually degrades. I'm sorry, brother. My job is to tell you how bad it is. I can't tell you it's good, but I can do it with a smile on my face. And I know you can still survive here. You can still make a living here. I don't, like I said, I don't play well with people. I had to get out of Lexus Nexus. I couldn't work there. Uh, it's just I don't like being around people that tell me what I have to do. And, and people say, well, you could be a rebel. I'm not a rebel. It's just for me to say what I need to say. I cannot be. And I used to say all kinds of stuff out there. John. Uh, what was it? Todd Williams. He comes up to me the other night. He goes, I, I went out working. I'm telling you, man, your testimony means something. You better watch that thing. You better watch it. He, he goes out and works on a, uh, a guy's refrigerator. He does what he does for a living. It's a refrigerator soap. What? Dishwasher. Dishwasher. Whatever. Some, some appliance that makes your life easier. 
Don't understand that one either. I mean, why would you wash dishes to put them in the dishwasher to wash dishes? Yeah. I haven't figured that one out, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm sure there's, some, there's a magical reason for that. But anyways, he comes up to me at the Chili Cook-Off. He says, hey, I went over to this guy's house to work on him. He worked at LexisNexis, and he said he knows you. Now, what would happen if he'd have walked in there and he said, Mike is the wickedest devil you ever seen, cusses like a dog and everything else. That was, I left LexisNexis seven years ago. I knew Todd probably for four or five, six good solid years. I used to go in and preach at Dan Asbell, Mike Baker, and Todd Williams and all them guys. They'd ask me in the room to preach to them at LexisNexis during work hours. <laughs> and we'd still all be working, man. We'd be saying, oh, we need this, need this, and Jesus said, and we need this, and this, and, this, and the Bible says. And, I mean, they just laughed and had a great time. Now, you don't think nothing about that. Seven years removed Within the last two weeks, I've had two people walk back, three, counting this other brother from, from uh, Norfolk, three people in the last week that have walked back into my life or have been introduced back into my life that have positive reports on my testimony. And I'm telling you, I'm just trying to warn you that what you do today will come back to you. Be sure your sin will find you out. We're all wicked devils. I'm a wicked devil. I already know what I am. But boy, I try to keep it under the blood as much as I can. I know my flesh. It is no good. Now, yours might be, I see all these little halos out there. It might be just a glow on the, no glasses, the glow on the light and everything on your head. But I'm telling you, brethren, it's, we're no different than Lot. If you don't watch out, how can you get that, that brother, that preacher that got in trouble that uh, I was listening to, he's still on the radio. I'm like, what's he still doing on the radio? Any one of us are susceptible. Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, don't matter. In the right place at the wrong time, we'll sell out. And it's just, he lot did that. He was willing to give his kids. It's something you got to think. You say, well, what happens if we're already here? Well, today, you, know, you stop today. You stop today, and you start fresh today, and you move on. Uh, Dr. Roman always told this story about an uh, old, old farmer as wicked as the devil. And, uh, and then he gets saved, and his kids all seen him wicked as the devil. He tried everything. His kids mocked him, laughed at him, just like Lot's does. And uh, the old farmer would go out into the barn out there, and he had a pole. And he, he'd get down by that pole, man, and he'd sit here. And it, I mean, I don't know if you've been in barns, but barn floors are hard. It's hard dirt. And he'd lay down, he'd get on it, and he'd, he'd get up here and just start praying, oh, God, he said, I messed up my whole life. And I did this and did this, and all my kids are going to hell, and, and I don't know what to do about it, Lord. What do we do? I don't know. I just don't know. And the man, day after day, he did that. And one day the man died. His sons were still lost, two of them. And he goes, one day the boys were walking by the barn door. I, I can see the barn door. Uncle Jay had a big old barn like that. The doors would be open. And they looked in there, the older seen that post over there, and he walked over there, and he seen two indents on the ground where his daddy's knees were. And he, that, he said, and he said, it's a true story. He said the boy put his legs, one knee in one hole, one knee in the other hole, got on that pole and asked Jesus Christ to save him. The other boy, he got up, and the other boy got down and did the exact same thing. You say, what is that? Well, the man made a mistake, and the man blew his life, and then all of a sudden he had to change. I watched my dad. He spent 30 years for the devil, man, and then he had to turn that thing around. I was willing because in my position, I was willing to help him the best way I could. The Lord already dealt with me on that situation. I was no better than he was. I could be just like him. Do you ever go down the road and see somebody, a homeless person, and think that could be you? That could be me any moment. That could be me right there. I'm like, Lord, what kept me from doing that? I heard a message the other day, and the guy was talking about the gospel, and he said... The gospel is not to make you a better person. The gospel is to get you saved. The gospel isn't to give you a better marriage. The gospel is to get you saved. The gospel isn't to have, have, let you have a better life and a better home. You may get all those things because you trust Jesus Christ. The gospel is to get you out of a place called hell and put you in a place called heaven. That's what he came to die for. And if we forget that, we start thinking, well, the gospel didn't. And, and what his point was, was the churches are taking this, and then they're, they're making the churches better families and better everything because the gospel. That has nothing to do with it. The gospel is to get you saved. If you, I told that brother yesterday, I said, he, they're trying to figure out how to disciple people. I said, with the Bible. You don't disciple them with anything other than the Bible. Uh, if you do anything other than the Bible, then you're adding stuff that they can add in there. Well, while Lot sits there and he didn't know what to do. Abraham knew what to do up on a mountain. Lot pleads for safety for his home, the two strangers, but to no avail. They're going to do it anyways. You, can't, you cannot appease people. You cannot appease people. 
Uh, you better get that in your head. You cannot appease your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your kids. You cannot appease them. Right is right and wrong is wrong. You can apologize for doing wrong, but right is right and wrong is wrong. And until we understand that Christ died for our sins, that I'm a sinner, it ain't going ain't to matter at all. Verse 9, Genesis 19.9. And they said, stand back. <laughs> go downtown and try to go up into the city and tell the judge or the mayor that they need to do the right thing. And they're going to tell you, well, the right thing is to, to love transgenders. and, and home. Why, why do I care about home? What, what's wrong with the other people? I think all lives matter. Not just black ones. I think green ones, red ones, purple ones, orange ones, white ones matter. It's not good to go around and do anything, but what they do is they just sit there. It's, brother, if you start, I told that brother yesterday from Norfolk, I said, this world is crazy and I don't even care about politics. I got a Bible that stands in my way. I know one thing, when you stand for what you believe, uh, they'll fight you back. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn and he will need be a judge. If you know, I'm going to tell you, if you do the right thing, you're going to make somebody mad. You can do it with a smile on your face. That's why I like little kids with me. Because you can hand them a track, they're going to hand it to somebody, and they can't get mad at a little kid. <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, you'd go out to tell somebody, uh, if you died today, would you go to heaven and hell? What's that? What concern is that of yours? I go to church. I'm like, well, you know, they're just going to get mad at you. You try to live a clean life, and they're going to get mad at you. I mean, no matter what you do, it, it's a struggle, but you got to get it in your mind and heart. That's what I want to do. That's what Abraham didn't want, not, no part of the city. And he will need be judged. Now will we deal worse with thee? They're going to do worse to him than they did with them. Uh, first of all, they didn't care too much about Lot, but he had cattle. He had everything else. And, and the supply chains were good, and, and uh, he fed everybody, and he took care of everybody. So we're going to leave you alone because you're doing us a favor. But the moment that favor stops and you start going against what we want to do, uh, then you're going to have a problem. And they have masked people in this country, in this world, that you stand up for Jesus Christ and, and you're going to have a problem. But you still need to do it. He says, and they pressed sore upon him, even Lot, uh, and he came near, uh, to break, uh, came near to break the door down, uh, break the door. Uh, any action, I wrote this little note to myself, any action against this way of life is quickly met with swift and rebuke and, and a violent man manifestation of hostilities, hostilities toward the perpetrator. You're going to get it. Verse 10. But the men put forth their hand. Now the men, he says they're talking about angels at the beginning. Now he's talking about men again. These men inside the house. But the men put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house uh, to them, and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. They're still trying to find the door. Brother, wickedness, to God, it's a serious thing. It's an extremely serious thing. There's a place where the heart gets hard in Romans. I'll get to that eventually someday. I started teaching Romans Thursday night. But uh, the heart is deceitful and wicked, and who may know it? These people have done got to the place in their life where their heart was so hardened that even though they just all got blind, they all just went blind. They're still saying, where's that door at, man? We're going to get him out of here. We want those two guys out of here. You're blind. Why would you, in my mind, I'm thinking, but see, that's because my mind is tainted with the word of God. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, why don't they just turn to you? That's what I would, well, yeah, because that's where I'm thinking at. And I've been doing this for 42 years. But what if I was living in the world for 42 years? What would my thinking be? Completely different. That's where their thinking is. Uh, and he, and they're still trying to weary, they're wearying themselves to find a door. And the men said unto Lot, two men, hast thou here any besides? Now, I'm telling you, brother, this world, you go to people's houses, they got these little angels with wings and stuff on them. There's, Lot would have known right off the bat, how come you all got wings? What's up with them wings under your shirt? What's them wing things you got there? <laughs> I like my Bible. It's just this, he'll, they'll go back and forth on things all the time. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides sons-in-law and thy sons? Never, never thought about Lot having sons. I was looking at a couple places, and they talked about his sons-in-laws. And Abraham stopped at 10. He stopped at the number 10. He says, and, and uh, the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides sons, son-in-laws, son-in-law, and thy sons, plural, and thy daughters, plural, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. 
He had two daughters out there that he went out to. That's two sons-in-laws. That's four people. Two sons-in-laws. Uh, two sons. The sons is plural. If the angels are saying he had sons, that's at least a plurality there. That's four so far. Two sons-in-laws. Two, two sons. Four daughters. That's eight. His wife and him, that's ten. Abraham had, no, Lot had ten people that he could win. Brother, if we can't win our families, we got a problem. They could be hard. I'm not saying all of them are going to be right in this world. I'm not saying that. Uh, little Wally come in the house, and every time he sees me, he screams. He's a wicked little devil. Uh, he, he needs to get saved is what his problem is. But I, told, I said, there's no guarantee on anything in life. But if you don't do the right thing, there's definitely a guarantee it will never happen. However, comma, I did the right thing. My dad reminds me a lot. Uh, even, though, even though Lot did what he did, uh, he was still considered a righteous man. And my dad did what he did, and you couldn't tell he was a, a Christian man at all, or saved. I won't say Christian, uh, I'll say saved. And at the end of that thing, uh, I ended up getting saved out of it somehow. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I thank God for it. I can't wait till I get to heaven and see why in the world he did what he did for me. Verse 13. He pulls him back in. He says, for we to get him out of here, for we will destroy this place because of the cry that is waxed great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Genesis 4.10. Let's go back a couple pages real quick. I'm going to look at a couple verses. When he starts talking about the, the, the cry, he goes, for we will destroy the place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. Uh, Genesis 4.10, uh, Cain kills Abel, and, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth uh, unto me from the, the ground, and thou art thou cursed from the earth. So when blood is shed, blood all of a sudden cries up, the ground cries up. You'll hear me in the Bible all the time talking about they'll take stones and put them there, and these stones heard everything we said. Brother, I think in heaven, God's going to produce some rocks up, man. He's going to say, this rock hurt everything. It's an amazing thing that we're just sitting now starting to learn how to record stuff. And uh, we've been doing it for the last hundred years, but for thousands of years they couldn't. They had to do everything by writing. And uh, I think the Lord had that thing said all the time. You, you go to White Throne Judgment, he brings a stack of rocks in. Uh, okay, rocks, tell me what he just said. And it'll go blah, 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 blah. And you're not going to be able to fight with that thing because every word that you said verbatim is going to come out of those rocks. You won't need witnesses. He'll just bring the rocks in. Uh, the, the earth cries out, and that's what he's saying. He goes, the people in Sodom has cried out. The, the, it's not necessarily the, the, the wickedness of the people. It's the, the innocence of the people that have been killed in that city probably, and all the other stuff's going on that's been brutalized and everything else has been crying out, and God said, I'm done with that thing. Uh, go to Luke 18.6. Luke 18.6. There just comes a time, man, where God's done. And I think that time is rapidly approaching. I thought that was rapidly approaching in 1980, 89. And here we are, 2021. But I still think it's rapidly approaching. I'm looking forward to any day, Luke 18, 6. I just think it's coming. And now what am I going to do? I'm going to still get up and do exactly what I'm supposed to do every day. I'm going to try to get stuff out of the way so I can serve God a little bit more every day that I live. I'm going to try to be the best testimony I can. And then when I hear the trump goes, doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm out of here. Uh, or if he takes my last breath and I'm gone, then I'm out of here. But in any case, I mean, I'm still going to do what I have to do on a daily basis. But in the back of my mind, I, this could be the day. This could be the day. Everybody says, oh, it can't be the day because it's got to be here, here, and here. I wouldn't be so sure about all that. The Lord, he, he says, you don't know the time. Nor the, you can know the time and season. You don't know the day and the hour. So there's no possible way you can know that. And the Lord said, he's, here's an unjust judge. The unjust judge, and the Lord uses him as an example. This lady cries to him all the time. Uh, verse 2, saying there was a, in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. Neither, and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within him, within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me. The squeaky wheel always gets the grease, by the way. I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. He just got tired of hearing it. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which every day every, cry night or day and night unto him, uh, though he bear long with them? There was people in that city that had cried. Lot, Lot was in that city. 
You know what saved, I think, saved Lot, no matter how bad it may look on him right now, that he would go so far, not, he wouldn't go no further. He just wouldn't do it. Right there at the end of that thing, I mean, he did something, but he was trying to protect somebody else. But to take your two girls and throw them out there, I mean, it's like, to me, that is, is some of the worst things, but that is part of life. That's part of, that's what life is. We're in a world that is just that way. There's, there's a lot of things you just can't get around. There's nothing you can do to, to get around that stuff. Uh, verse 14, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-laws, uh, which married his daughters, and said, Up, uh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-laws. You're not going to be able to go out today, and I already know that. You're not going to be able to go out today and say something. Be wise as a servant, harmless as doves. You've got to, first of all, get in your mind that I'm going to straighten this thing out between me and the Lord. It's a relationship. Everything's a relationship. I'm going to straighten it out between me and the Lord. And I'm going to do what the Lord says do. I did that. I remember sitting on that back porch that night in 1980. I sit there and said, I told the Lord this. I said, look, I, I said, I done messed up 22 years of my life. Don't mess them up. I said, I'll be good for nothing for the rest of my life. I'll be good for nothing. I already know that. I said, you, you don't have to do a thing. You didn't mess me up. I messed me up. I'll never be good for nothing. I said, but it is stopping right here in my life. It's stopping tonight right here in my life. It's stopping. I'm not going to be like my dad, and I'm not going to be like his dad. I'm not going to be like my brother. I'm not going to be like his aunts, my aunts and uncles, all drunks. I'm druggies, and I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to do this no more. It stops right here. And if I never have nothing the rest of my life, it's stopping right here. I thought for sure that it was all over. That brother told me, you think you get sick of my stories? That brother I talked to that I haven't talked to in 37 years, he said, Mike, I remember you on the ship, and you didn't have a wife. And you knew that God would never give you one because <laughs> I remember that. I'm like, he's telling me my stories, man, from 37 years ago. I'm like, man, 37 years worth of old stories. And he's, he's bringing, he said, oh, I'm sorry to bring you back up in your face. I said, oh, brother. I said, I, I, said, I tell them all the time. I think they're great. I like them. I like to hear them because, because it reminds me what the Lord did for me. And I might have thought, yes, David, I was going to write a sermon. I was going to preach this morning, but I didn't. David over in, in uh, first, first uh, Samuel said, uh, there is a step between me and death. Saul was trying to kill him. Stay, all David wanted to do is help the king. I can't help it that David could go out and kill 10,000 every time Saul killed 1,000. Can't help that. I can't help it David just had a, a sling and a, a stone, and, and he just had a drive that Saul didn't have. He, he got over some fear. He, he got over some stuff, and he just trusted God, even as, I mean, the Lord let him take out a bear and a lion, and, and he was just perfectly happy with that. And, and he just got, his confidence level was all the way up to as far as he could go. And he's willing to do anything. Saul just got mad at him. He's talking to Jonathan. He says, there's a step between death and me. Jonathan said, oh, shut up. My dad wouldn't do that to you. Don't think just because you think you know somebody that they'll, they're what you think they are. Jonathan's a good guy. I love Jonathan. But his daddy hated David. David was only probably 18, 19 years old at the time. He died at 70. He thought there was a step between him and death at any given moment. And Saul was throwing spears at him, javelins at him, everything. 52 years later, maybe, 54 years later, David's laying on a bed and set Solomon up as a king. Just because you think death is going to happen any moment, <laughs> you may go another 50 years. You never know, man. You just never know. You never know. Here's Lot, man. He's, he's sitting here, whatever... We worry about our, our living. Well, your living is the Lord's anyways, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, well, if I don't do this and I don't do this, then I'll lose my job. Well, then maybe you don't need that job anyways. Have you ever thought maybe God should come first, the Lord Jesus Christ should come first? Uh, I just thought that. I just thought that. I mean, I read my Bible. I was a good Roman Catholic. I was raised that way. I'm thinking in my head God should come first. I've never seen a priest do that or the nuns do that. I've never seen anybody else do that. I just think God should come first. And they, they just, I'm just like black and white. I mean, I don't understand. I don't know no gray area here at all. That's why I don't play well with people. Uh, because I just think it should always be this way. And I try to be nice, but sometimes it don't come out that way. Uh, but Lot, Lot, uh, his kids mocked him. And, and what he did is he tried to run out there immediately. It's too late. It's too late. You need some time, but the time has run out. You don't have that time anymore. We have time. That's what I say about David. Uh, David had 50 years still left. Now, we still have some time left. There's no guarantee that uh, the Lord's coming back in five minutes. He might not come back for another 20 years. 
Uh, it's going to be sometime soon, but it's not, it could be any time in the next 15, 20 years, 15, 20 minutes on up from now till when he comes back. That means I got time. If I get my life the way it should be, that I'll have a testimony that maybe will affect some other people. And maybe I'll have a testimony where I can talk to my kids and help them out. Verse 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife. Guys, you charge your house. Take thy, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. They're going to wipe the place out. Lot was not ready to leave the, the world behind yet. What's it going to take for us to let this stinking, filthy thing go? You got to work in it. I got that, man. We got to work in it, live in it. Uh, but what's it going to take to let it go? Well, I mean, what's it really going to take? Lot wasn't ready. His family wasn't ready to leave the world uh, behind either. Uh, I can see Mrs. Lot packing everything up, trying to get, get everything going. Finding the right wagon. Probably couldn't find the horses too late in the night. Guys still running around out in front of her house trying to get to the door. They couldn't get to the stables to get the horse and hook it up to the thing. I mean, none of that stuff. The city just didn't stink bad enough for him yet. When's it going to stink bad enough for us? Uh, it never will. It just, nothing, what, what's going to make us get up and make the move? Now, brethren, you don't have to move uh, out of the city to serve Jesus Christ. You don't have to do that. Uh, but it, it has to get to the place where you realize, hey, this thing's bad enough and I need to back away. I tell everybody, I said, the moment you can say back away from this world for about six months, just six months, that's six 30-day periods. We'll go Jew, Jewish months. Six 30-day periods, 180 days. Just step back and let, quit doing everything and just let the world pass you by. And in six months, I said, well, you'll find out. You can probably do it in three months now. Probably do it in two. Uh, you'll see that the world is six months down there. And for you to get to there, you're going to have to make a lot of changes again. And you just may not want to make those changes. No more. Uh, you may just be far enough away from it that you don't see it anymore. The city didn't stink enough. However, destruction is coming very near. And while he lingered, man, it, it, how many times we have to hear the word of God before we do what we need to do? And while he lingered, he's got two angels telling him. The men laid hold upon his hands and upon the hit, uh, hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the other six he just left behind. And the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. He, they took him outside, set him out there, and then they tell him exactly what to do. Hebrews 13, 11. Ah, oh, we got a couple seconds. Go to Hebrews 13, 11. Lot, Lot's no different than we are. He says, as it was in the days of Lot. We're, we're right there, brethren. Our world is right there. I like trying to find stuff and sell it and make money because I don't have to worry about I mean, the church helps me out quite a bit, but uh, I, I still have to make a few bucks here and there. But I don't, I don't, uh, and I like our church being paid off too, man. I think it's the coolest thing in the whole world. There's, there's nothing you have to worry about. Uh, Hebrews, 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 Hebrews something. Hebrews 13, 11. He says right here, he says, for the body of those uh, beasts who, who blood is brought, man, let me put my glasses on. 11. For uh, the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now they took him out of the city and took him out on the hill Golgotha and hung him up on a cross and killed him. So Paul goes on and finishes it up here. He says, let us go uh, forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For we have no uh, continuing city, but we seek for one to come. That's what Abraham was looking for. Uh, Pilgrim's Progress, I talk about Pilgrim's Progress, I'll stop right here. I talk about Pilgrim's Progress all the time. But that's exactly what Pilgrim did. I mean, uh, John Bunyan wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress. The, the most selling book, the most famous book in this world outside of the Bible is a book called Pilgrim's Progress. And he wrote that book about a man that was in the city of destruction. Dayton. Dayton is the fourth worst city in, in uh, Ohio as far as murders and everything else goes. But who cares? Uh, you could be in New York City. I, I would leave New York in a heartbeat. Uh, and San Francisco. And yeah, here's one. We got a witness right here. She was in New York. She could tell you all about it. Uh, uh, I wouldn't even get off the ship in New York. We pulled into port in New York in 19, whenever they did ever the, the Statue of Liberty, whenever they unveiled it for the first time. We were one of the ships out there in the, in the harbor, and then they pulled us in the port, and they, I said, I ain't even getting up. The way they told me I had to get off that ship, I said, I'm staying on this thing. I don't trust New York. 
I, my own country, you can't even go nowhere. It's just, and that was back then. That's 86 or something, 86, 87, whenever that was. Terrible. Let us go forth unto him. Jesus was, was crucified outside the gate. I've been in Jerusalem. You got to go outside the gate, man. I, I talked to Dr. Peacock about that, and he goes, yeah, he goes, I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, he said, I've been there too, and, and where you're talking about, everything is, is, is in place. He didn't know about the cistern there. I had a guy tell me about a cistern that's sitting in that place. And he took me over and showed me, and there's a hole in the ground. I, I looked down, and, and you look way down in there, and it's, it's like a lake down there. I'm like, what is that? As far as you can see on either side, it's just water everywhere. He goes, that's what you need for a garden. He goes, and he said, they crucified Jesus. There was a tomb, a new tomb, cut in the side of the mountain, and there was one sitting there in this garden. There was a garden there, and he said, to have a garden around here, you got to have water. And he goes, that wasn't made yesterday. He said, that thing's been here for thousands and thousands of years. And I'm like, yeah, man, that thing, uh, Doc didn't know about that. I said, yeah, i seen that thing. I said, yeah. I, I believe that was the spot outside the city. Cities are a bad place. Uh, I don't know about you, but cities just aren't, aren't good to be around because uh, they're, they're guided and directed. People are put in charge. Uh, our, our Constitution of the United States is a moral document, strictly moral. And the only way that thing is going to work is you've got to have moral people. And the day that that thing was written, they were moral. I didn't say they were saved. I said they were moral. And so they wrote a document that was moral. But they did not foresee all the immorality that was going to happen on our planet in our country. There's just no way you can see all that stuff. So they, what, what you end up with is a bunch of people who get into office because they tell you, oh, I'll kiss babies, I'll do whatever I have to do to get in office, and then they'll take you to the bank when they get in. That's why we're not even supposed to be involved in that stuff. You know what I told, I told that brother yesterday, I said, if, if everybody would go out and win somebody, if you just took his little crowd right here and you went out and won somebody, and then we disciple the ones that you win and I win, and we keep doing that, that they'll go out and tell people, we wouldn't have that problem in our country today because everybody would be saved. It wouldn't take but about 70, 80 years for the whole country to get saved probably. And it probably wouldn't take that long. If you take 1,000 people and everybody goes out and wins somebody, that's 2,000. They all go out and win that's double that thing, that's 4,000. Then you keep a penny, you take a penny and double it a day. In 30 days, you got over a million bucks. A penny, one penny, one little copper penny. Uh, I don't think you could try that because it's kind of hard to come up with all that many pennies. But if you could... Lot was a backslidden, righteous man. And he chose to be backslidden because he didn't do what the word of God said. He came out of a city or of the Chaldees. He should have never come out with Abraham, but he did. And because he didn't come out like Abraham came out, Abraham was told of God to move. Lot wasn't. Because Lot didn't, he went right back into the world he, was, he came out of, which is Sodom. Brother, I'm telling you what, if you, you need to wait till God tells you exactly Exactly. He'll tell you exactly what to do. You don't have to worry about it. I saw uh, the, that brother yesterday at Kroger's. He goes, well, I'm just trying to figure out what God wants me to do. What God wants me to do. That's the biggest place you're going to find a mistake right there because you're going to be trying to run to find something to do and you're going to be running to the wrong place. It isn't this glorious, oh, I'm doing the God's will. And angels all around you singing glorious and stuff. No, sometimes the Lord just tells you exactly what to do and then he goes away and he comes back 100 years from now and you're supposed to have an ark. I mean, will you stick it out for 100 years? And you know, sometimes it might take you 500 years to get into the place where you got enough sense to do it for 100 years. He might wait, might wait 500 years for you to get, well, he won't do that for us anymore because we're not going to live that long. But, I mean, he might wait till you're 35, 40, 50 years old before he does anything. You know what he did? I, I was 49 years old, 48 years old when we started this church. Would I tell somebody to wait that long? No, but that's what I needed. And you say, why is it? So that I would stop and just do what he told me to do and not just rush off to the right and left. Brother Solomon, when he said that thing to me that time, I'll shut up right here. He said, go somewhere and sit for 20 years and they'll come and find you. That brother called me from Norfolk, Virginia 37 years ago. He found me. <laughs> you know how he found me? On the internet. And I think I, think I was getting ready to say, you know, we need to quit broadcasting these things because I, I am a terrible... I have a terrible face on, on anything, especially when I see myself in the mirror. I, it's really bad. I just want to throw up. But he's seen it, and he was on the USS Scott with me. Father, thank you for your blessings. <laughs> thank you for letting us come to church this morning. Just thank you for a book that we can hold in our hands. Thank you for a hope uh, that endureth forever, Lord. Thank you for mercy and kindness and grace, and, and you love us. And, Lord, we can do it. 
Uh, you, you said in there we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. We can, we can survive in this world, Lord, and we can be the testimonies we need to be. Uh, Lord, today is a new day, Lord. We can always start it today and go on. I remember sitting on that back porch. I told you that day was going to be the day that I started it. And, Lord, it, it started 42 years ago and it's been going on ever since and hadn't always been great every day. Uh, but, Lord, it's still going on down the road. I just thank you for that. And I just, Lord, help us to uh, see that we, we don't need to be like Lot. We can be like Abraham upon the side of the mountain, Lord. We, and we can still be in the city, but we can be the testimony we need to be, Lord. Uh, I just pray the Holy Spirit work in our lives. Help us to get the things out that's displeasing, Lord, that would hinder us and, and quench him. And, Lord, uh, that we could become what we need to be. Again, thank you for uh, church this morning. Bless the morning services. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.